everybody to stay turned up. So we're going to hit this on one more time. <laughs> Praise the Lord. 
of the Lord. Praise God. Isn't God good? I said the Lord is good. Amen. Hallelujah. Now we got a lot going on folks. Don't forget um, the uh, youth are going to forward very soon and then we got uh, vacation Bible school and then we got July 4th. We got a lot, a lot of stuff happening. Amen. And uh, so make sure you go by the table back there and sign up to help with the uh, vacation Bible school and then we're going to be announcing more later about July 4th and the help we'll need for that. But I'm glad to see you here. And uh, like my wife said, there's several people we uh, uh, know that's at the beach. And and so uh, if you're watching online, praise the Lord. Good morning to all of you as well out there. And uh, so good to be here. And how many of you enjoyed revival? How many of you already determined that you're going to hold to what you got and what, to what you received? Amen. You're not going to turn loose. Now, how many of you already have had the devil to try to talk you out of what you did receive? Huh? I'm telling you, you know, he comes immediately for the word, right? I said he comes immediately for the word. Wherever you're standing, whatever you're believing for, whatever you're praying about, that's exactly where he's going to hit you. The hardest and attack the hardest. So you've got to stand your ground. Amen. You know, sometime back uh, when all this stuff was going on in Florida, you know, and they was talking about that uh, stand your ground law, and uh, I thought, you know what? Florida's not the first people that came up with that. God, God's the one that came up with that law a long time ago. He says, stand. Having done all to stand, you got to stand. you got to stand your ground. Amen? You ain't got to defeat the devil. All you got to do is stand your ground. Jesus already whooped the devil. That's all you got to do is stand your ground. Some people talk about always fighting against the devil. Somebody told me one time they was fighting the devil. And I was like, no, no. You, you're wasting your time if you're fighting the devil. The Bible says resist him. Amen. The Bible says to stand, but it don't say nothing about fighting the devil. Because Jesus already defeated the devil. Amen. Why you want to whoop somebody who's already been whipped? Think about that. Amen. People fighting the devil. They're trying to beat somebody that's already been beat. <laughs> Y'all ready to worship the Lord with your tithes and offerings today? Don't forget now, uh, Haiti, the project we got going on in Haiti, and the, the uh, Benevolence Fund, of course. And so at this time, there's envelopes in the chairs around you. If you would take one of those, fill it out, and uh, mark, make sure you designate, you know, where's, what's tied, what's your, your seed. And uh, if you're making a check, you can make it to Faith Family Church. Those that are watching online, you can actually give online as well. And so I want to encourage you right now to release your faith. Don't just throw it in the plate. Release your faith. Tithe. Tithe tithing involves saying something. How many of you know that? Tithing involves saying what the Word says that you're supposed to say, standing on His promises. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this day thanking you for your love and for your mercy. You are good, and your mercy endures forever. And you're so good to all of us. And we thank you for Jesus and His blood, whereby we have access into your very presence. We're so thankful that as we come boldly this morning, we thank you for the mercy and the grace that we receive to help us in all through life. We bring these tithes and offerings with a heart of thanksgiving, with a heart of faith and expectation. We thank you that we're blessed. We thank you that every need is met. We thank you, Father God, that our storehouse is running over. We are so thankful, Lord, for the laws of the tithe and seed time and harvest. In Jesus' precious name, amen. All right, let's just go ahead.
save kids? Huh? Now the uh, fireflies are already out there, the, the smaller ones. If, if you need to take your child, you can go ahead and, do, and the nursery is, is also available for those that need it. And if you want to get closer, come on, get closer. We've got a lot of empty uh, seats around the front if anybody wants to get closer this morning. Praise the Lord. Lord. Now, some of y'all act like you're tired. <laughs> now, you had uh, Thursday and Friday and Saturday to get rested up. Amen. And uh, I tell y'all what, uh, we had an awesome time with Brother Phil, didn't we? Amen. Amen. Praise God. And, uh, you know, there's some things that I want to reiterate that Brother Phil said, and then we're going to go on from there. I'm not going to try to uh, re-preach what he preached, but there are some things that were said that you need to make sure that you don't forget, and then we're going to build on, on something, okay? All right, open your Bible, if you'd be pleased, to Psalms 92. I'm going to talk to you about the language of faith. Everybody say it out loud, the language of faith. Language Tell your neighbor, you got to learn how to speak the language of faith. I mean, listen to me. You can't separate victory from faith. If you're going to have victory in your life, then you've got to understand faith. And you've got to understand the language of faith. Now, I know for the many, many years that I've been teaching on faith uh, that a lot of people, even though they've heard it, heard it, heard it, they still hadn't got it. You can teach the principles of faith, but the spirit of faith has to be caught. Now, listen to me. The principles of faith are taught but the spirit of faith has to be caught. And if you hadn't caught it, then you need to say, Lord, I want to catch the spirit of faith. Amen? The spirit of faith. You say, what are you talking about, the spirit of faith? What are you going to learn? If you'll listen, you're going to learn some things, and you might want to jot some things down because there's going to be a, a couple of things that I'm going to say that if you don't write it down or at least get the CD later so you can go back and listen to it some more, you're not going to, you're not going to, be, you're not going to grasp it. You're not going to understand it. Okay? Here in Psalm 92, there's, a, there's something that the psalmist wrote that really jumped out at me as I was meditating on some things that has been said this past week and what God is really wanting to do. Now, one of the things that Brother Phil told us was that the Lord said to him concerning uh, this church that those that were connected to this ministry will be taken into a season of extreme favor. Everybody say extreme favor. Extreme favor. Extreme favor. Now, remember, he talked about being connected to the ministry. And he said, now, you know, he said, I don't like the term hooked up. I've used that term myself a lot of times in the past. He said, but I don't like to use the term hooked up because you think about a fish on a hook, and he can get himself off the hook. He said, so I, I use the term being connected. And I'm going to tell you something. I've had divine connections in my life. You've had divine connections, or at least opportunities for divine connections, whether you was aware of it or not. You might not have realized it at the time. Now, to have extreme favor in your life, he said it's going to take extreme faith. Extreme faith. You know as well as I do that there's degrees of faith. If you've read your Bible, you've been listening, then you know that there are degrees of faith. God has dealt to every man the measure of faith according to Romans 12, 3. The measure. Everybody say the measure. The measure. Say it out loud. I have been given, have been given. The, measure the measure of mountain moving faith. faith. So you've got to understand that, folks. You know, you have the God kind of faith. If you're saved, you have the God kind of faith. If you're truly born again, you have the God kind of faith. You have the faith of God. You have the kind of faith that God has. You have the kind of faith that Jesus has. You have the kind of faith that Jesus used when he spoke to the fig tree and it dried up from the roots. You have the measure of that faith. Now, listen to me. How much your faith has grown is not up to me. It's not up to God. It has nothing to do with your husband or wife or your children or the circumstances. Your faith can only grow by the word of God. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen? You say, well, I pray a lot. That's a good thing to pray, but listen to me. I saw some signs the other day. I was going through this little town. Everywhere I saw, it says, praying hard. And uh, I don't know who they were praying hard for, but I thought, I hope they're praying in faith. Because you can pray as hard as you want to, but if you're not praying in faith, it's not going to do a bit of good. Amen? Faith does not come by prayer. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. 
Only the word produces faith. Amen? Now, I'm telling you this because I want you to understand something. If you're going to have extreme faith, then you're going to have to take the measure of faith that God gave to you and build it with the word. And the more words you get in your heart and in your mouth, the stronger your faith will become to where you can become like the church at Thessalonica where they had a uh, growing, exceeding growing faith, Paul said. Now, remember, there was times when Jesus spoke to the disciples and he asked them, where is your faith? Why is it you have no faith or little faith? But concerning Abraham, the Bible says that he was strong in faith. So he had strong faith, didn't he? You can have strong faith, which means you can have weak faith. Amen? Where is your faith this morning? What level is your faith at today? On a scale of 1 to 10, where would you put your gauge, where would you put your own faith on that scale of 1 to 10? Is it a 1? Is it a 5? Is it an 8? Is it a 9 or 10? Let me tell you something, it's up to you, it's not up to God. I said it's up to you, not up to God. And it's not up to me either. Did y'all hear what I said? I said it's not up to me. I said a lot of people want to bring, blame the preacher. Some people blame the preacher for everything. Amen? I mean, some men get mad at home and blame, start blaming me. They do. I mean, they start professing about me. And I ain't got nothing to do with it. Amen? Now, here in Psalms 92, talking about being connected. I don't, I'm going to spend much time here. I don't think anyway. But in Psalm 92, the Bible says in verse 13, those that be planted, everybody say planted. Now, the Hebrew root word there actually means rooted. You're rooted in the house of of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall steal. Everybody say steal. steal. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing, which means they're going to prosper. To show that the Lord is upright, he is my rock. There's no unrighteousness in him. Now, I want you all to grasp something here. The Amplified Translation says in verse 15, they are living memorials to show that the Lord is upright and faithful to his promises. So people, he's talking about people who's been planted in the house of God. They've continued to flourish and to prosper even in old age and bring forth fruit. He said these people, they're living memorials to the goodness of God, to the righteousness of God, to the faithfulness of God to, concerning his promises. Now, you know, it's strange to me how that I'll be prepared and the Lord is leading me and showing me different things, you know, and somebody will say something to me, you know, right before service. And it's like, bam. See there, I told you. I told you. And I'm a yeah, Lord that confirms it to me. Somebody says something to me just a few minutes before church, you know, concerning someone who used to come here a long, long time ago. And they're old now. And they saw them. And they're not in too good a condition. They're not in good, good shape at all. You know why? Because they didn't stay connected. You've got to get connected. You've got to stay connected where God wants you. Divine connections, amen? Y'all listen to me for a minute. I am connected to this family, okay? I got a wife, I got kids, I got grandkids. I am connected to this family. I'm not going anywhere, they're not going anywhere. We are divinely connected, amen? amen. When I was young, just got saved, God divinely connected to Kenneth Hagin Ministries, and I'm not going anywhere. Now, he's gone on to be with the Lord, but guess what? His ministry still is flourishing throughout the earth, amen. all right? And I'm not leaving the heritage and the roots that God planted where he planted me long ago. Now, you need to make up your mind and ask yourself this question, am I planted in the faith family church? Because if you're planted, that means you're not going to get mad and run off. Right. Amen? I said if you're truly planted, divinely planted, you're not going to get, you know, I, I rub you the wrong way and you get your feelings hurt and you lay out for, for six months. <laughs> Amen? Amen? You say, no, this is where I belong. I remember when the Lord gave my wife a message sometime back. It's been, a, I guess, a few years now. And uh, she talked about how they're growing up in the Baptist church, how that people have, were there for generation after generation, families, generation after generation. You know why? Because they had a different mentality than people have in, in word of faith churches. Yeah, they do. They have a different mentality. Now, what, what's the mentality? It's an ownership mentality. Yes. Amen. I mean, this is where I belong. This is where my family was. Now, don't get me wrong. There are times when people need to leave and need to go because the word's not being taught. But I'm talking about the mentality itself is what we need to have. This is where God has planted me. Amen? 
I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm not going to get mad and just disown, you know, my family down in Georgia because I don't like some of the things they do. I, don't, I might not like the way they live. I might not agree with some of the things they say, all right? But I'm not going to disown them, uproot, and say, well, you're not, you're not my family anymore, right? Now, you ought to have the mentality that's nothing going to run me off. This is where God prayed to me. Just because somebody gets my parking spot or gets my seat, I'm not going to leave. Just because somebody don't speak to me, I'm not going to get offended. Amen. Just because the pastor preaches something that made me mad, I'm not leaving. Amen. You ought to have that, you ought to have that mentality. I dare the pastor try to run me off. Amen. Now, are you, are you planted this morning? Are you connected in the house of the Lord in Faith Family Church? Now, think about this. Another thing that Brother Phil said to us, he said there's only two languages. He said the language of what? What was the first one? Language of God. And what was the second one? The language of the flesh. Now, you need to write this down. You should never allow circumstances to dictate your language. You should never allow circumstances to dictate your language or to even change your language. You should always speak the language of God, which is the language of faith. Now, he kept talking about the language of God. And you know what the language of God is? It's the language of faith. God never spoke a word of doubt, never has, never will. Never spoken a word of unbelief. Amen? He's a God of faith. He's a faith God. He moves along the lines of faith. Where he sees faith, then you can see his power moving in, in, in according with that word, with that word of faith. Paul said, I preached the word of faith. Amen? Paul didn't preach a word of doubt and unbelief. He didn't preach a word of fear and worry. He preached the word of faith. And that's what I'm going to preach is the word of faith. Amen? Because that's what's going to help you. That's what's going to change you. That's what's going to bless you. Praise God. Isn't the Lord good? Amen. Now, I want to say, show to you one more time an in, in, uh, amplified version of before you leave there in verse 15. Some of you just getting settled down good. Now, notice it says in the Amplified Bible, Psalms 92, 15, they are living memorials. They are living memorials. What are they li living memorials to? They're living memorials to show that the Lord is upright. Everybody say upright. upright. Notice I didn't say the Lord is uptight. Huh? Some of y'all thought that God was uptight, but he's not. Amen? He's upright. That means he's righteous and he's just. And people that are still flourishing, even old age, they're memorial to that uprightness, to the faithfulness, up to his promises. Amen. Now, having said that, I want to begin to talk to you, what does it mean to have the language of faith? Go with me, please, to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Now, I'm not going to go ahead and tell you right now, I'm not going to try to finish everything I've got in my heart this morning. I'm going to preach what I feel like God wants me to preach, and we're going to find a, a cutting off place, and, and we'll go from there next time, okay? Here in Hebrews chapter 6, but I do want you to remember something. If you want the entire this message, you can't come today and miss next Sunday. Amen. 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 God, everybody say God is faithful. faithful. I'm so thankful that God is faithful. Amen. Amen. Look, look at Hebrews chapter 6 in verse 12. Hebrews 6 verse 12. It says that you be not slothful, not lazy, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. He's talking about Abraham. After Abraham had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Now if you're taking notes, you need to write this down. It takes faith and patience to receive God's promises. It takes faith and patience to receive God's promises. Now, some of you are thinking now, you know, I don't have a whole lot of patience. Well, let me tell you what the word patience here means. Now, you're, you see, you'll see the word patience all throughout the New Testament, but it's, it's not the same word in the Greek, and it doesn't always mean the same thing. Here, it simply means to endure. It means to endure. 
to be steadfast, to persevere. That means you're not going to back down. You're not going to quit. Amen? You're going to continue to press in standing on the Word of God. Continue pressing, believe in God, believe in His promise, claim in His promise. Amen? So notice now, you remember how that in uh, Romans 4, just go ahead and open your Bibles to Romans 4 with me. You remember how that Paul said that Abraham believed God and that it was counted to him as being righteous. You remember that? Everybody say, I believe God. God. That means he believed his promise. He trusted God, right? Now, we know that he's the father of faith, the Bible says. Now, let me, let me help you all to understand something. Faith, in the original Greek, it simply means this, a conviction based upon hearing. It is a conviction based upon hearing. You hear God's word. You have a conviction based upon hearing. What you heard, you know that God is faithful. You know that God is not a man, that he should lie. That it's impossible for God to lie. So when God says a thing, then you have a conviction that that thing is true because you know that he's faithful and watches over his word to perform it. Amen? This man trusted God. He had faith in God. So it was put to his account. It was credited to his account. That he was righteous. Now, as I was thinking about that, I wish I'd had a a ledger that we could actually put on the screen big enough for everybody to see. You know, if you wanted to uh, buy a ledger to keep a record of your spending, for example, you have a ledger, and on one side in that ledger, that book, you have what is known as debits, and on the other side, you have credit. Now, on this side, debits, that means you owe something, right? But over here on this side where it's credits, that means it's to your good. Amen? You know, uh, let's say, for example, that uh, maybe some company you deal with a lot, you buy from them a lot, you know, you trade a lot with them, and maybe you got a a letter in the mail or you get an email from them, and they say a mistake is made, and we have realized through our accounting department that you have a credit of $100 with us. You know what that means? That means you can get anything that they have up to $100 value, and you don't have to pay nothing for it. That means they owe you something, right? That means it's yours. Anything of the $100 value is yours already. Now, when Abraham believed God, it was put in the credit account, all right? It was not put over here in the debit side that he owed anything, but rather it was put to his credit. Now, anything that God has is his. All he's got to do is lay claim to it. Are y'all with me now? That's the reason you need to understand what it means when the Bible says in Romans 8, 17 that we are heirs of God and joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. All that he has is ours. Everything God has is yours. Everything that Jesus has already obtained through his death, burial, and resurrection belongs to you as a child of God. Amen? Now, here in Romans, if you'll read that, you'll you'll begin to discover something here. You need to understand the difference between grace and obligation. Paul makes it very clear. Let's read it in in Romans 4. I'm just going to pick up in verse 1. What shall we say then that Abraham our father appertaining to the flesh, has found. If Abraham would justify by works, he has where to glory or to boast, to brag, but not before God. For what says the Scripture? Abraham believed God. It was counted unto him for righteousness. That means he had a right standing with God. He was right with God. Now to him that works is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the godly, His faith is counted for righteousness. He's talking about us, just like Abraham. If you worked all week, listen to me, if you worked all week and come payday and your boss walked out with a check and said, here, I got something to give you, what would you say? You say, you're not giving me anything, right? You owe me that. 
I worked for it. I earned it. You're obligated to pay me. You're not giving me anything. Amen? Now, let's say, for example, if he told you, okay, Monday, I want you to just take off Monday morning and don't even show up until I call you. So Friday afternoon, he calls you up. Now, you've been out fishing, hunting, whatever you want to do, laying by the pool, you know, just enjoying yourself. And you hadn't been to work all week. But Friday afternoon, he calls you and says, come on in, I got something for you. So you go by, you know, and he hands you a check. Say, here, I, I, I'm going to give you something. What would you do then? Oh, thank you. Hallelujah. Now, wait a minute. I, I, don't you understand? I've been off all work. Oh, yeah, I know you've been off work. I told you to take off work. But I just want to give you something. Now, that is a free gift that you did not earn. You did not work for. You do understand the righteousness that we have now through the blood of Jesus is something that we did not work for. We didn't earn it. We wasn't good enough to merit it. It was simply a gift that was given to us because we believed. Amen? Amen. We believed with our heart and we confessed with our mouth. And I'm talking about really believed. I'm not talking about we just did something because somebody said to do it. We believed what we had heard, that Jesus died for our sins on the cross, that God raised him from the dead on the third day that he ascended into heaven and sat down at the right hand of the Father and sent the Holy Ghost into the earth. We believe with our heart and we confess with our mouth. And when we did, guess what? We were given the free gift of eternal life. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen? I don't know if you know it or not, but you've got to work to go to hell. The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. Amen? But listen to me. You can receive eternal life simply by saying, yes, I do believe. And I do receive. And I confess with my mouth. Therefore, I have what God wanted me to have. Amen? We're talking about speaking the language of faith today. Now, I want you to think about something. Talk about that boss giving you something. Now, I said it's a gift. It's a favor, right? But what if he didn't promise you something and you showed up wanting it? Huh? Now think about that. If he promises you something, you've got to choose to believe his promise or not. If he promised you that uh, uh, a free week's pay and you stay out all week, but he pulled this one time last year before and you showed up and he wouldn't give it to you, do you believe him this time? No. Uh-uh. Let me tell you something. God's never lied to you. God never lets you down, Amen. and he never will. Amen. Now, you may have some misunderstandings about some things. You may be mixed up in your beliefs about some things, but God has it, is not the one to blame. That's reading the Bible teaches, don't blame God. If you're going through tests and trials, temptations and all this stuff going on in your life, don't blame God. Amen? You know, just this past week, I was talking to my mom, my mom and uh, she said, uh, do you remember... The uh, woman that is a friend of your sister's that had cancer that she told you about? And I said, yeah. And, you know, because she had said something to me about it. And, and I, I knew just from just the uh, experience that I've had with people and uh, that what they told me and what the doctors had said. And I, I knew outside of a miracle from God she won't last long. But I didn't say that. But anyway, my mama called me and, and we were talking. And, and uh, she said, you remember that woman? I said, yeah. She said, well, she, she passed away. She said, God took her on to heaven. And I thought about that in the slide, but then I thought, well, I, don't, I, I can't do it. And I said, Mama, how old was she? She's 52. I said, God didn't take her. I said, God didn't take her. Oh, what, do you, what do you mean God didn't take her? I said, he received her, but he didn't take her. Amen. 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 Some of you might have saw uh, Ralph was telling me just recently about uh, what Jesse the Prentice had said. The Lord spoke to him. And he said, uh, I think how did he, how he, he said, I have the authority to receive her, but not the authority to take her. The power, I have the power, but not the authority. See, God gave authority to the man. The heaven, even the heavens are the Lord, but the earth has he given to the children of men. He put man in charge. He gave man authority in the earth. Now, he'll receive people to, into heaven, amen, even if it's before their time. Thank God the woman had gotten saved. But you know what is sad? There was nobody there to, talk, to teach her uh, how to receive her healing. Amen? 
Well, I want you to not know just how to receive salvation. I want you to know how to receive your healing. I want you to know how to receive strength. I want you to know how to receive uh, financial prosperity or anything else you need in your life. Amen? Because it all works the same way. I mean, yeah, there's, there's little different things uh, like, like financial prosperity. Yeah, you've got to believe God, and you've got to do your part. You've got to do what God says. Amen? You've got to tithe. You've got to sow your seed. But one of the major things that you're going to have to learn if you're going to have victory in your life is you are going to have to learn to speak the language of faith. Amen? And you're going to have to quit being bilingual. You're going to have to quit one day speaking the language of faith and the next day the language of doubt. One day the language of God and the next day the language of the devil. Amen? Because the language of the flesh is nothing but the language of the devil. And the language of God is nothing but the language of faith. Amen? Amen? And it's not going to do you a bit of good if you're speaking one language one day and another language the next day. All it's going to do is just get everything confused. Right. Amen. 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 Now, that's true, folks. I'm just telling you, God's word is truth. His promises are truth. And it takes faith and it takes patience to receive those promises. Amen. Amen. Now, write this down. Number two, faith receives what grace has provided. Faith receives what grace has. Everybody say has. Has is past tense. What grace has already provided. I want you to understand this. Receiving God's promise depends entirely on faith in the one who made the promise. It depends entirely on the one who made the promise. You're in Romans chapter 4. Listen to verse 16. I'm going to read it from the Amplified. Therefore, Inheriting the promise is the outcome of faith and depends entirely on faith in order that it might be given as an act of grace or unmerited favor. Man's faith, man's faith is what? Your faith, let me put it like this. Your faith is what causes the work of redemption to be manifested in your life. You say, what are you talking about the work of redemption? I'm talking about the salvation that was obtained, the healing that was obtained, the strength, the peace, the joy, everything that was obtained through the Lord Jesus Christ by his death, burial, and resurrection, then your faith is the determining factor as to whether or not you will be able to receive those things into your life. Everybody say, my faith. My faith, my faith is the determining factor the determining in the work of redemption. Does that make sense to you? Do you understand that? That our faith is the determining factor. It's not God's will. God's will is not the determining factor as to whether you're saved or not. God's will is not the determining factor as to whether you're healed or not, whether you're blessed or not, whether you're prosperous or not. God's will is not the determining factor. Amen? God's will is not automatic. You find his will in his word. You want to know what his will is about your body, about your marriage, about your children. You want to know his will concerning anything in your life. You go to the word of God because his word is his will. But now your faith is the determining factor as to whether you will ever have those things in your life. It's not a matter that God's holding back on you. No good thing, no good thing does he withhold from those that walk uprightly. Daily he loads us with his blessings. Daily his blessings are available to every person. God is no respecter of persons. He's not holding out on anyone. Are y'all hearing me? You say, well, well, God's holding back on me because he doesn't like me as much as he likes everybody else. Are you kidding me? Think about it. God's love is unconditional. Amen? I said God's love is unconditional. He doesn't look at his children and say, well, I, I like that one there. She's prettier than that one there. And, and Oh, yeah, he's skinnier than that guy right there. I like him better. No, no, it has nothing to do with your size and color and all that kind of stuff. Amen? God created us spirit beings. He sees the heart, the spirit of man. Amen? And he moves along the lines of faith. God is not moved by your need. Y'all better be writing some of this stuff down because it's not in my notes. 
I'm telling you, God is not moved by your needs. You say, but, but I need some money today. Big deal. Who doesn't? <laughs> but I need God's help. His help's available. But it's not going to happen just because you need it. Right. Amen? Are y'all hearing me today? I'm telling you, your faith is what determines as to whether you're going to receive or not. That's the reason when people come to Jesus, like the blind men, two blind men, and he asked them, so what do you want? They said, we want to see. Do you believe that I'm able to do this? Yes, Lord. He said, according to your faith. Look at your neighbor and say, according to your faith. Be it unto you. He said, you're going to receive according to your faith. Are you with me now? You're going to receive along the lines or the level of where your faith is. That's the reason some people can receive a lot more than others. Because some folks have developed their faith through the word where their faith is an 8 or a 9 or even a 10 maybe. And others who've been saved for 20 years, their faith is still at a 1. Because they don't read the word. They don't meditate the word. They don't speak the word. They never learned the language of faith. As a matter of fact, you can read your Bible every day, and if you still speak the language of, of the flesh, you're not going to receive what's in the book. Amen? Y'all with me now? Are y'all getting this? Faith receives what grace has provided. That means that faith is the channel. Think about this. Through which you receive what grace has already provided. Now, y'all know this, but just for I don't want to take it... Uh, uh, you know, I, I just don't want to presume that everybody knows this. So let's just put Ephesians 2, 8 up on the screen for everybody to see. Here's a good example. What do I mean when I say faith receives what grace has provided? Past tense, has provided. Has provided. There are people that have died and have left a great inheritance to someone in their family and the family was not made aware of it. That person was never made aware of it. For some reason, they didn't know that they had been left a great inheritance. And they lived years barely getting by when there was literally thousands of dollars in a bank account somewhere that belonged to them. Are you understand what I'm saying? There are warehouses in heaven. Think, now, I'm going to listen to me now. Matter of fact, there is a building in heaven that is so big you can't see from one end to the other end of it. And there's a book in there that's got your name on it. Yeah. It's a book about your life. It's a book that was written before you was ever born. All the days of your life are in that book. And everything that God planned for you and intended for you and wanted you to have and provided for you is in that book. There are warehouses in heaven that are full of inventions and cures and songs and all kind of things. It's got your name on it. Amen. Things that belong to you that were provided for you from the foundation of the world. But here you are, barely getting by, struggling. True story. I hadn't told this in quite a while. Some of you remember this. True story. A preacher who had a great big church many, many years ago, I think it was in Chicago, had a great big church, thousands of members. He had a heart for the, the elderly, the poor. They literally built these small homes, very small homes for the elderly, people that were truly widows, as the Bible calls them, had no help, nowhere to go, no family. And so, uh, and he would get out occasionally, and he would visit these people. So one day he stops, he knocks on the door of this little home, and the elderly lady comes to the door, and she invites him in. You know, Pastor, come on in. so good to see you. Can I get you a cup of tea or coffee or something, you know? And so he sits there, and he's visiting with her a little while. And he happens to look up on the wall, and he sees a legal document. It's just a piece of paper, and it's framed, and it's on the wall. And he can actually see the name of a bank that's on it as well. So he asked the lady, May I ask you what that document is? And she says, well, when 
I was younger and able to. She said, I served a certain very wealthy man in this city. I served him and his family, took care of his children for many, many years until he passed away. She said, and just before he passed away, he called me into the room and he gave me this piece of paper and then he died. And she said, and I can't read. She said, I took the paper and I framed it just to have something to remember him and his family by. And he said, well, do you mind if I take it and have it examined? And she said, oh, no. She said, that'll be okay, but be sure to bring it back because it has such sentimental value to it. But it had more than sentimental value, folks. So he takes this document to the bank that's listed on the document and asked to speak to one of the officers that he knew. And he said, will you tell me what this document is all about? So the man takes it and he goes back in his office and he comes out a few minutes later. He says, we've been looking for this lady for years. He said, what do you mean you've been looking for? He said, well, this man left her a very large sum of money in appreciation for what she had done for his family. And it's just sitting in the vault and we have been trying to find her. Here this woman was living in a home provided for her by the church, a little small, basically one-room house, you know, barely getting by when she had riches in the bank. Faith, listen to me, received. Now, had she known, had she known what that was, she'd have went and she'd have received, she'd have took what was hers. Amen? See, it's important that you know what belongs to you. That's the reason the, the Bible says that God said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. You need to know what's yours. He that belongs to you. I'm telling you, listen to me, divine prosperity belongs to you. The blessing of the Lord belongs to you as a child of God. Amen? Now, I told you to put it up there. Here it is. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that out of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Everybody say it out loud. By grace, by grace. Through, faith. through faith. By grace, through faith. Now watch this, folks. Let me show you something. By grace, you are saved through faith. By grace, you are healed through faith. By grace, you prosper through faith. Let's just say, for example, there was two towns. And uh, one of those towns, we'll say cities, one of those cities is called Grace, okay? Well, Grace is way over here, all right? There's another city, and the name of that city is Faith, okay? Y'all with me so far? Now, there's only one way to get to Grace. Anybody want to guess how it is? You got to go through Faith to get to Grace. There's no way around. There's no other way to get to Grace but through Faith. You've got to pass through Faith to get the grace. And if you don't ever go through faith, guess what? You're never going to get the grace. But once you go through faith, all right, by the way of faith, and you get the grace, you know what you're going to find? You're going to find a store over here that carries the grace of salvation. You're going to find another store over here that carries the grace of healing and the grace of prosperity and the grace of strength and the grace of peace and the grace of joy. And you just get to go in there and get what you want and you don't have to pay nothing for it. You know why? Because it's already been paid for. But you can't get there unless you go how? Through faith. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Titus 2.11, Titus 2.11, I want y'all to see this. Faith receives, faith takes. When you see that word receive in the New Testament, it usually means to take possession of, to take possession of. For the grace of God, that brings what? Now think about this. There's a grace of God that brings other things. There are things that accompany salvation, according to Hebrews chapter 6. Things that accompany salvation. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Are y'all hearing me? The grace of God that brings salvation. Well, folks, Peter talks about the manifold, many-sided graces of God. There's a grace of God that brings healing. 
There's a grace of God that brings peace and joy. That's a grace of God concerning divine giving. Look with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. If people believed the word and acted on the word, they wouldn't have no trouble. Oh, you'd have, don't get me wrong, when I say you don't have no trouble, what I mean is there will be tribulation that will come, but you'll just go right on through it. You won't stay there. It won't overtake you. Amen? If you understood the language of faith and operated the language of faith all the time, tribulation can come. And you'll be like Jesus, be of good cheer. Why? He said, I overcome the world. Jesus overcame the world for us, and we overcome the world, how? By our faith, the same way that Jesus did. He showed us how to live victoriously. He taught us how to walk by faith. He taught us how to use the language of faith. Notice something that the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Corinth. Now, this is his second letter. And in chapter 8, he says, Moreover, brethren, we want you to, to know of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Everybody say the grace of God. Grace now, what is he talking about here? In a great trial of affliction, in the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality, for to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves, praying us, begging us, the Greek says, with much entreaty that we would receive their gifts and take upon us the fellowship of the minister to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Insomuch that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. Now what grace is he talking about? Therefore, as you abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all diligence and in your love to us, see that you abound in this grace also. The Amplified says, excel in this gracious work of almsgiving, the grace of giving. Everybody say the grace of giving. Oh, my, my. While I'm on, I'm going to go ahead and tell you this. Not only is there a grace for giving, there's a grace for living. I said there's a grace for living. I'm talking about living everyday life. The grace to deal with the pressures of life. The grace to deal with the problems. The grace to handle everything that comes your way. Now, there's a way that you can live. Listen to me. When Paul told the Galatian people, he said, Oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? He had came and he had taught them the right way, the way of the Lord. Others came behind him and got them all confused. And they started going back from where they had came from. They went back from faith to works. And he began to talk to them. He said, you've fallen from grace. He wasn't talking about the grace of salvation. He was talking about the grace for living. He was talking about you're living in such a way now that the, you, you have made the grace for living ineffective in your life. Are y'all getting this? You need a grace for living every day. So that when the people cut you off on the road, you don't get mad and cuss and throw sign languages. <laughs> Amen? You just speak the, less, the language of faith, and the language of faith does what? Blesses and does not curse. Right. Hey, I bless you. I mean, they sit there and they're doing other things, you know, flying delta and all that stuff. You say, hey, I bless you in Jesus' name. And they look at you weird, man. What's the matter with him? They was expecting you to respond like they did. Don't you understand that? When people curse you, when people cuss you, they expect you to cuss them back. And it blows their mind when you smile real big and say, bless you in Jesus' name. Huh? Try it. I dare you to try it. I dare you to try it. You'll get some of the weirdest looks. Amen. All right. Y'all getting anything out of this today? Is this helping you? Say it out loud. I have to go through faith to get the grace. Amen. Glory to God. 
Now, <clears throat> now I know a lot of people talk about, you know, well, this language of faith stuff. Calling the things that be not as though they were. You know, I, I, I just don't feel it. I, I'm just not feeling it. You know, pastor laid hands on me. You know, the evangelist laid hands on me and uh, told me to keep the switch of faith turned on. Told me to call the things that be not as though they were. Say I'm healed, but I, I, I'm just not getting it. I'm just not feeling it. Well, let me tell you all something. Now, you might want to write this down, so I'll say it kind of slow, okay? <clears throat> your head will eventually catch up with your heart. Just go ahead and do it. In other words, do it because you trust the people that's telling you to do it. Do it because you know this. the Bible teaches this. You might not get it. You might not be feeling it. But listen to me. Your feeler may be tore up, okay? I, I listen to me. We don't walk by feeling. The Bible says just walk by what? Faith. Faith. Not by sight. Not by senses. You can't be, listen to me. You've got to refuse to be moved by what you see and feel and hear and all that stuff. You just choose to be moved by the word of God. Amen? And so you make a decision, I'm going to say what the word says. Now, I may not be feeling it. It may not seem quite right. I even feel like I'm telling a lie when I say that I'm healed and I got all this pain in my body. But yet, I know what the Bible says. I know what the pastor's saying is true. So I'm just going to go ahead and do it. I'm just going to start saying, by the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. Jesus took my infirmity. He bare my sicknesses. My faith, listen to me, is, is taking hold of what grace has provided. God has provided healing. Jesus took my infirmity. Jesus bore this sickness. He bore this disease. disease. He bore this infirmity, this pain. It's not mine. I refuse to have it. I, don't, I still ain't feeling it. still ain't feeling it. Keep on. Keep on. You're, listen to me. Eventually, you're here to catch up with your heart. Okay? Everybody say, faith is of the heart. Faith is of the heart. Not, the not the head. Are y'all getting this? Faith is of the heart. It is not of the head. And how does faith come? By hearing what? Word. Hearing by the word of God. Everybody say rhema. R-H-E-M-A. Rhema. You know what it means? The spoken word. It's not logos. So then faith cometh by hearing, listen to me, the rhema of God, not the logos of God. The logos has to become the rhema. And the rhema is the spoken word. Logos, hear. Rhema, hear. Everybody get it? Listen to me. Faith works in two places, the heart and the mouth. Faith works in two places, the heart, the mouth. You've got to take the logos, the written word, and it's got to become rhema, the spoken word. My tongue is like the pen of a ready writer. I'm writing it. Every time I say it, by his stripes, I was healed. I'm writing it on my heart. By his stripes, I was healed. By his stripes, I was healed. Let me show you all something. Uh, put Proverbs 16, verse 23 on the, on the screen for everybody to see. Now, you're going to have to write this down now. What I'm about to tell you, you're going to have to write it down. Because I promise you, you're not going to remember this. If you don't write it down, you've got to meditate on it. See, the Bible says the heart of the wise teaches his mouth and has learning to his lips. The heart of the wise. Everybody say, my heart, my heart is teaching my mouth. Teaching my mouth. Now, I want you to write this down. <clears throat> Y'all ready? If your head will teach your mouth to speak, even when you don't need it, if your head will teach your mouth to speak, even when you don't need it, your heart will teach your mouth to speak when you do need it. Let me say it again. If your head will teach your mouth to speak, now I'm talking about speaking the word, speaking right, even when you don't need it, your heart will teach your mouth to speak when you do need it. How many of you know that in times of crisis is when your flesh wants to talk the loudest? That's when your, your flesh really wants to talk. When you're mad, how many of you, your flesh wants to talk? Let me tell you what I think about it. <laughs> huh? Yeah. I mean, you're sitting there, you ain't even got enough money to go out and eat a cheeseburger. And, 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 you're, and you're getting upset. We don't never have enough. Look, 
Look at them over there eating at the steakhouse. <laughs> going to the beach and eating seafood. We don't even have money to go to McDonald's. What are you doing? You're speaking the language of faith. You're speaking doubt. You're speaking unbelief. You're speaking decrease instead of increase. I'm telling you, if you'll read Proverbs 18, 20, 21, you'll find out there's a mouth that speaks increase. And you cannot experience increase as long as you're speaking decrease. The Lord wants to bless you more and more, you and your children. Amen? How many of you want the Lord's blessings? More and more for you and your children. I want it for my spiritual children as well. Not just my natural children, but my spiritual children. I want all of you blessed more and more. That's the reason sometimes I feel like, and I don't allow the language of the flesh to, to have its way, but when I hear people saying things, I just want to tell them, you need to shut up. <laughs> but I try to be nice. Amen? My niece got so mad with me three years ago at the hospital when my sister had a heart attack. They got her to the little town there in Baxley and got a helicopter come from, from Savannah. Matter of fact, we got a call as soon as it happened, and by the time they got her to that town and got her in the helicopter and flew her to Savannah, we were about there ourselves, wasn't we, honey? I mean, we jumped in the car, and, man, I took off down that interstate. I was putting it down there, I'm telling you. <laughs> and it's a good thing we did because we got down there, and they were doing emergency surgery on her, and she flatlined. Now, you think anybody there knew what to say or knew what to do, huh? No, but we, we rebuked death. It matters where you go to church. It can mean the difference in life and death. I'm talking about one of your very family members. It can be the difference of life and, or death. Life and death of your marriage, life and death of your finances, amen? And we rebuke death. And thank God she came back. Well, after she came back, you know, they got all these tubes and stuff on it. You know, and I mean, the diagnosis is still not good. They lost her a second time, same thing. She's got these tubes everywhere, you know. Here comes her granddaughter. Now, I didn't sit them down one time. I said, here's the scripture. Here's the word of the Lord. Everybody listen to me. I gather them together. Y'all better learn something here. Y'all yeah. listen to me now. And, of course, a lot of people, well, I don't want to hurt nobody's feelings. And What, do you want the people to die? Huh? Are you more concerned about hurting somebody's feelings than you are the person living? You understand what I'm saying? So I sat the whole family down, her husband and all the family that was there. And the room's pretty full, you know. And I said, now listen, the scripture says, I will live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. I said, this is the word that God has given me for, for my sister. And I said, and I want everybody to remember that scripture. And I don't want you to say anything different. I don't want you to talk about how bad she looks, what the doctor says. I want you to say she'll live and not die. Every time you walk in that room, you look at her and say, you're going to live and not die. Every time you think about it, she's going to live and not die in Jesus' name. She's going to live because I say she's going to live. Well, after that happened the second time, you know, all of a sudden, here's one of her granddaughters. And she comes, you know, in there, oh, oh, Mimi didn't want to live like this. Mimi won't want to live. She really let her go ahead and die. And I said, shut up. Amen. Made her mad. Oh, she got so mad. I said, you need to either go home, listen to me, Shut up and go home or just sit down and be quiet and don't say nothing. Amen. Oh, she got so mad. Well, you think you're an expert, don't you? And I said, pretty much. <laughs> and I said, I've been studying this Bible for about 40 years. And I said, I may not know everything that's in there, but I promise you one thing. I know 10,000 times more than you do. Amen. And I'm telling you, I don't want to hear another word of doubt and unbelief come out of your mouth. Oh, I'm telling y'all what, I believe she'd have been a little bit bigger. She's a little bitty thing. I, she'd have jumped on me. She was, oh, she was mad. She was fighting mad. I'm telling you, ask my wife. Well, she was mad at me. Later on, we, she was okay later on. I explained to her later on, you know, why I did what I did. I had to get her attention. We had to stop that. I wanted nothing but the language of faith spoken. Amen? You got to speak the language of faith, folks. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Have I give you all a scripture to go to? Mm-mm-mm. Everybody say, starting right now. I purpose in my heart. I'm making a decision with the help of the Holy Ghost reminding me I will call the things that be not 
as though they were. Romans 4, 17. This is exactly how God taught this man, Abram, to get the things that he had provided for him, that God had provided for him. Amen? The Weiss translation says, cause the things that are not as being in existence. Cause the things that are not as being already in existence. You know why? Because they are in existence. You might not can see it with your physical eyes. You might not feel it with your physical senses. But yet, it already exists. Where? In the realm of the spirit. Remember the song we were singing, the new song? The theme song the Holy Ghost gave us, gave Holly, and we're singing? We're going to a different place. If you want extreme favor, it's going to take extreme faith. That means you've got to step your faith up. Amen? I'm telling you, he's talking about, remember Brother Phil said, we're not just talking about a step of faith anymore. We're talking about being launched. Right? Being launched. Well, folks, if that's going to happen, now listen to me, and I don't want to burst nobody's bubble, but it's not going to happen just because Brother Phil said it. It's not going to happen just because the Holy Ghost said it. Some of y'all look at me funny. Who's got to say it? You got to say it concerning your own life. You got to prophesy it. Folks, listen to me. I can prophesy to you. Milton can prophesy to you. Brother Phil can prophesy to you. I mean, we can stand here and prophesy to you and rub your head till the hair comes off. And it will not come to pass unless you walk out and you prophesy it. Amen? Hmm. Revelation tells us that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now think on that. Selah. Find out what he said. That's the spirit of prophecy. It carries the spirit of prophecy. And the spirit of prophecy in its essence is to create and restore. Why do you think the Holy Ghost gives these certain words to these songs that Holly's writing, and we talk about speaking the intentions of the Lord to what? To create and restore. Restore things. Bring restoration to things. Set things in order. Rearrange things. Make things right. Amen? Now, what did God say concerning this man who was first called Abram? As it is written, Paul is quoting now, Something that was written, already written in Genesis 17. I have made thee. Everybody say, have made thee. That would be like, listen to me, that would be like God walking up to a person laying on his deathbed. All right? Jesus walks up to him and says, I have healed you. No difference. God speaks to a man who is 75 years old, he is childless, his wife is 10 years younger than him, they are barren, they are childless, God walks up to him and says, I have made you the father of nations. It's already done. I have made you the father of nations. Before him whom he believed, even God, who quickens, makes alive the dead, and calls those things, listen to me, which be not as though they were. He calls the things which be not as though they were. Ephesians 5, 1. Put it on for everybody to see. Ephesians 5, 1. Paul writes these words. To be followers of God. Everybody see that word followers? You need to write this down. In the Greek, that means imitators. That means to imitate God. That's exactly what Paul was saying. Imitate God. You're one of his children. Act like your father. Imitate your father. You've seen the little boys who father their dad's footsteps in the snow. And they'll put a foot here and they'll put a foot there. And eventually they learn to walk like the dad, talk like the dad. What are they doing? Imitating. Girls do the same thing with their moms. They're imitating. God wants us to imitate him. He calls the things that be not as though they were. What does he want us to do? The same thing. Call the things that be not as though they were. He said, now listen to me, Abram. I know you're an old man, and I know your wife's an old woman, and I know you're barren, but I got a plan for you, and I got intentions for you. 
And here's my intentions. I've already made you the father of nations. Now, I'm calling the things that be not as though they were, and I want you to do the same thing. Because in order for this to come to pass, the word spoken to you has to be spoken through you. Write it down. The word spoken to you has to be spoken through you. You've got to take what God says to you. Listen to me. Whether it's in this book or he speaks a word directly to you, you've got to say it with your mouth. You know why? Because you have the authority in the earth. I said you have the authority in the earth. God's people has authority in the earth. Listen to this. Amplified says he speaks of the non-existent things that he has foretold and promised as if they already existed. The Revised Standard Version says he calls into existence the things that do not exist. Go with me to Hebrews 11.3. Hebrews 11.3. God calls into existence the things that do not exist. He calls the things that be not as if they are already in existence. What is, he, what is he talking about here? He's talking about the fact that there are things that you can't see, feel, touch. They're not, don't seem real to the natural, right? That's the reason the natural man can't receive the things of God. The man who functions in the natural cannot receive the things of God because the things of God are spiritual. As long as you can be saved, but as long as you function in the natural, you're not going to receive the things of the Spirit. Are y'all with me now? Amen. Now watch. Hebrews 11.3. Hebrews 11.3. Through faith. Everybody say through faith. Amen. Through faith we what? Through faith we understand. Here, sister, I get choked myself sometimes. Don't worry about it. You're fine. You're all right. Through faith. Everybody say through faith. Through faith. We, understand. we understand. What do we understand? What do we understand through faith? Huh? That what? Come on, y'all talk to me this morning. Y'all better get this. You're going to need it. I promise you, you're going to need this. I'm telling you, you're going to need what I'm talking to you about this morning. And you got to stir yourself, shake yourself, and go back and listen to it over and over and over until you really do get it. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed, how? See, here's what a lot of people don't understand. They'll, they'll just say, well, I know that God did this. I know that God spoke, and he said that being like was, and so on and so on. And he created everything by his word, but I'm not God. But you're supposed to imitate God. You're created in the image of God. You're created to function like God. You understand this? We are spirit beings created in the image of God. The reason so many people are tied to this world system is because they're still functioning in the natural order of things. Folks, we are a spiritual being. Even the atheist who does not believe says he doesn't believe in God. He is a spiritual being. He is a spirit. If you don't believe it, go to his funeral and you will see a dead body laying there. But that which gave him life is gone. The spirit of man. Right? So he says, through faith we understand the word for framed by the word of God. How do you do it? So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. The things you can see, the things you see now, were not made out of things that you can see. The things that God created were not made out of something that he could already see. Not with the natural eyes. Are y'all getting this? The things that you need like healing for your body, okay? The things you need like the anointing to fix your marriage. The power of God to work in your life to prosper you, to bring you out of debt and set you free. Those things that you cannot see with your natural eye, they do not appear to the natural eyes, okay? That's what he's talking about here. I want you to write something down. There's enough power in God's Word. There's enough power in God's Word to make that which does not appear to appear. Did you get that? There's enough power in God's word to make that which does not appear to appear. Mm -mm -mm. Abram means exalted father. That's what the name Abram means, exalted father. Abraham means father of nations or father of multitudes. 
Y'all remember in Isaiah 51 how God said, look to Abraham, to Sarah. I called him when he was but one. I blessed him, and I made him many. That's what the Amplified says. I called him when he was but one. I blessed him, and I made him many. Now, with these instructions that he gave to this man, he said, don't call your name Abram anymore. Call yourself Abraham. Call yourself father of nations. I made you the father of nations. Now, you call yourself father of nations. I've already healed you. Now, call yourself healed. How many of you want the blessing of the Lord? Do you really want the blessing of the Lord? Yes. Ephesians 1 3. I want, I want everybody to get this now. You need to march in your Bible. I hope this is helping you this morning. Ephesians 1 3. See, you're not waiting on the blessing of God. Do you hear what I said? You're not waiting on the blessing of God. You may think you are, but you're not. Amen. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has. Everybody say, has. has. Now, I don't know about you, but where I went to school, has is what? He has already. It's done. It doesn't say who's going to. Who is going to bless us. No, that's not what it says. It's already done. It has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Where are they? In the spirit. That's where you've got to learn to use your faith is a reaching into the realm of the spirit and bring it into the natural Though, listen to me, God's word has the power. Romans 1, 16, Marilyn. God's word has the power in it to make things that do not appear to appear. It has the power to make healing appear in your body. It has the power, listen to me, to make financial increase appear in your life. Strength, peace. Joy. Paul said, I'm not ashamed. That's the reason Paul wasn't ashamed of the gospel. He said, a lot of people, they, 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 think, they think about going to church in the Bible. They kind of think like, well, you know, old folks used to do it, and they said I should, you know, and I guess I can kind of go along with it, you know. Ain't no big deal whether I go or not. Oh, really? Let me tell you all something. The apostle Paul was in line to become something really, really big where concerning the law, the Sanhedrin, the temple. He was a Hebrew born to Hebrew parents. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was taught by the greatest, most famous teacher in the land, in the world at that time, Gamaliel. He sat at his feet. He was tutored by Gamaliel, top teacher of the law. This man was headed for big things concerning where he was at at that time in the law. But you know what happened? Jesus appeared to him. He got a revelation. And through this revelation, he understood that a man is saved by grace through faith. Listen to me. And not by keeping the law. Not by the works of the law, but faith in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, I counted all but done. All that stuff I left behind. He said, I counted all but done for the excellency. Listen to me. He said, I want to know him. And I want to know the power of his resurrection. Jesus. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He wasn't ashamed to stand before Caesar himself, the most powerful figure in the world at that time. Jesus said, you will stand before Caesar before it's all over with. And he did. He wasn't ashamed to stand before kings and to preach this gospel. He said, because it is the power of God. Everybody say power of God. Power. And that word power, we're talking about inherent power. We're talking about something that's got power within itself to produce itself. Are y'all listening to me this morning? You do realize there's no reason why every single one of us here, there's no excuse why every person here is not saved, healed, delivered, blessed, prospering, full of peace, full of joy. If you've got an excuse, that's all it is, an excuse. That's the reason Jesus asked his disciples one day, why do you reason among yourselves? All reason is, is logic apart from the word of God. You're just trying to figure things out with that little pea brain. Think about it. And the Bible was never given to us to make sense. And I know there's a lot of people telling you, yeah, but come on now. You know you've got to, have some, you've got to use common sense now. Common sense in the Bible has nothing to do with one another. 
Common sense learn, is all about learning how to drive a nail. It's all about learning to change your oil. That's common sense. When you come to the Bible, throw it out the window. When you come to the Bible, say, you know what? This Bible, this book was given to us to make faith, not to make sense. Because that's the reason your mind will buck so hard when you, when you hear the Holy Spirit saying, oh, yeah, and that special offer tonight, by the way, I want you to give $250. That don't even make sense, Lord, because all I got is $250. I got bills to pay tomorrow. That don't make any sense. It wasn't supposed to make any sense. You understand that? Walking on water makes no sense. Tithing and expecting increase makes no sense. Laying hands on the sick and expecting the cripple to walk makes no sense. Hand, head, walk. What are you talking about? We're talking about faith here. We're talking about taking God at his word, knowing that that word has the power within itself to produce itself. It is a seed. When Jesus taught the parable of the sower and they didn't understand it, he said, how are you going to understand the other parables? This is the parable of all parables. The seed is the word of God. And the son of man goes forth and he sows the seed. Oh, yeah, some falls over here, some falls over here, some falls over here, some falls over here. On this one, it's just, you know what? You might as well put it down there. You know, the ones of you that sit there this morning half asleep and you didn't hear a word I said, this seed has failed. This seed this morning has failed on that hard path. And the devil comes immediately and just eats it up like the birds eating the seed out there. And then there's some, you know, it falls on the, the uh, thorny ground. And you heard a little bit this morning and you get a little bit excited and you may even come up and say, Pastor Ben, boy, that just blessed me today. Hallelujah. I just got goosebumps. It just feels so good and I can't wait, you know. And you go out there tomorrow and the devil hits you exactly where, you, where you're believing. The cares of this life and tribulation choke the word. It's like the thorns growing up and killing your garden. Think about that. The rocky ground. Not much soil in the rocky ground. No, no roots. Not good soil in that rocky ground for, for the seed to take root. I'm going to tell you all something. Listen to me. Seed does not come with roots attached. Are you getting this? You've got to plant that seed, and it takes some time for the roots to develop. And the deeper the roots grow, the stronger the plant will be and more fruit that it will produce. But then, thank God, there's that good ground. Hallelujah. That good ground. Y'all know what good ground is, don't you? Good ground is ground that's been prepared. Oh, yeah, yeah, you took time to prepare that ground. No, 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 you didn't just go wide open all week and didn't pray and didn't read your Bible and didn't spend time praising God, going back and forth to work. Listen, no, 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 instead, you know what you did? Let me listen to me. In good ground, you didn't listen to the country music on the way to working back or rap or even love songs. No, you had Pastor Eddie in. Or you had Bill Winston. You had some good word or some praise music playing in your car. And you just praised God all the way to work and listened to the word all the way home. Good ground. Listen to me now. Good ground is ground that's been prepared. Amen? Now, I know there's exceptions. And we've all, you know, had times when we've done things on Saturday night. But you know the rule in our house, don't you? The rule in our house is that we've always, we plan for Sunday morning. We don't just wait and see what's going to happen Sunday morning and then decide whether we're going to church or not. No, you plan for it. The good soil is soil that's prepared. Amen? It's cultivated. It's rich. It's been fertilized. You've got to speak into that soil. You've got to speak into the soil of your heart. Amen? I am blessed. Hallelujah. 
I am righteous through the blood of Jesus. The blessing of the Lord is upon my life. The blessing of the Lord is upon my family. The blessing of the Lord is upon my children. The blessing of the Lord is upon my wife. The blessing of the Lord is upon my finances. Amen. Hallelujah. I thank you, Lord, I'm created in your image and righteousness and true holiness. I thank you, Lord, that I have victory. Victory through my faith in you. I have victory, Lord. I overcome the world. I overcome the devil by the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony. And here's my testimony. And I want everybody to hear it. I want God to hear it. I want the devil to hear it. I want the angels and demons to hear it. I'm washed in the blood. Hallelujah. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. Glory to God. I am counted faithful. God knows that I'm faithful. Are y'all hearing me? Paul said God put me into the ministry. He counted me faithful. He saw something in Paul when nobody else saw it. He saw something in Paul deep on the inside of him. Are you hearing me? Because Paul was faithful even when he was persecuting the church. He was faithful at it, right? I never thought about that until you said that the night, Ralph. He was faithful even when he was persecuting the church. When he was observing the law, he was faithful. You understand this? That's the reason I realized something. People that serve the devil well, when they get saved, they serve God well. Think about that. Amen. The Lord is good. Well, let me see. I think right here is a good time for us to get cut off, cut off right here. Now remember, as long as Abram called himself one, he remained one. You need to write that down. As long as Abram called himself one, he remained one. And as long as you call yourself defeated, you're going to remain defeated. As long as you call yourself sick, you're going to stay sick. As long as you call yourself poor, you're going to stay poor. Amen? Amen. As long as you go around, you know, you, these people, they, they, they've, been, they've been labeled. They have a diagnosis from the specialists, from the experts, you know. And so they make a point of saying it on a regular basis. If you don't believe me, talk to a diabetic. They say it quite often. Hey, you don't want to cook it? No, I can't have that. I'm a diabetic. You go to a restaurant, sit down. You want to try a dessert? No, no, I can't. I can't do it. I'm diabetic. Huh? They ought to say no thanks. Exactly. Amen. But you, the longer you say it, the, as you continue to say that you are one, you will remain one. Are y'all getting this? The woman who's been told she can't have children, she tells everybody she can't have children. Well, why do you? How come you don't have any kids? Y'all don't want to have any kids? No, the doctor said we can't have a kid. I can't have children. Oh, really? So you're just sealing it, right? You're just putting your seal of approval and adding your faith to what the doctor said. I can never have children. Hmm? Amen? I can never do this. I can never do that. And the devil will tell you, and you'll never be happy, and you'll never have a good marriage, and you'll never be rich, and you'll never own your own home, and you'll never do this and do that. You going to believe that stuff? It's up to you. Now, I'm going to let y'all in on a little secret. I thank God and I love Holy Ghost meetings as much as anybody. But I'm going to tell y'all right now, you're not going to live in victory off of Holy Ghost meetings. You say, well, what's going to... See here, here's the thing. Y'all ain't half as stirred up as y'all was when Brother Phil got up here stomping his feet and turning it up and all this kind of stuff. See, y'all don't, y'all don't have half as excited. But I'm going to tell you something. I'll bet you anything, if I was a betting man, I could ask, get up here and tell us what you learned from Monday to Wednesday night, and there's not a one of you can stand up here probably more than 10 minutes, if that long. I love Brother Phil, and we're going to have him back because people need to be revived. They need that at times. But if you do what I tell you to do, you won't need revival. And if you do what I'm telling you to do, you won't need a miracle. Did you hear what I said? Amen. The miracles is for the world. Are you getting this? Y'all do understand that, right? If you do what we're teaching you right here in this church, you won't need a miracle and you won't need revival because you're going to stay fired up and all your needs are going to be met, amen, and you're going to live off the seed that you sow. Amen. Now let's pray. Father, thank you so much. For your precious holy word. We are so thankful for Jesus and his blood. We are so thankful for the mighty Holy Ghost. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us. We are so thankful for the word. Hallelujah. Your word, Lord, is a lamp unto our feet. 
a light into our path. We are governed by your word. We are a people of faith. Everybody shout out loud. I am a believer. I am not a doubter. I believe the word of God. The word of God is truth. I govern my life by God's truth. I agree with God's word. I will say what he said. He said he will always be with me. I say, I say, he's with me. He said, he said by whose stripes you were healed. I say, I say, by whose stripes I was healed, I am healed. Are y'all getting this now? I don't want you to take it from here. Go ahead. Take it from here. Begin to say it. Right where you need the most help from God, take a hold to some scriptures right now and begin to say it out loud. I am blessed. I am blessed. My wife is a gift from God. I appreciate that gift. And I'm going to honor that gift. And I'm going to love that gift. And I'm going to treat that gift the way that Christ treats the, the church. Amen? And I'm thankful for my children. My children are heritage of the Lord. I say my children are blessed. I say my children are taught of the Lord. Great is my children. Great is my seed in the earth. Hallelujah. Come on, saints. I'm a tither. I'm a giver. Thank you, Father God. The windows of heaven are open. The windows of heaven are open. You said it. I agree with it. How can two walk together except they be agreed? I agree that I am blessed. The blessing of the Lord is upon my life. The blessing of the Lord is making me rich, and you had no sorrow with it. I thank you, Father, that the Lord is the strength of my life. You are my strength. I am strong in you, Lord. I am strong in my spirit. I'm strong in my mind. I'm strong in my body. I have a strong family. My finances are strong. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Come on, somebody needs to open their mouth. I, I can sense in my spirit, somebody right now, you know what you ought to say, and the devil's doing everything he can to get you not to say it. Go ahead and say it anyway. It goes against the grain. It goes against everything you're feeling right now. Say it anyway. God is love. God is love, and the love of God is shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Ghost. God is love, therefore I am love. And I love. I love like God loves. Hallelujah. Now with every head bowed, every eye closed, maybe you're here and you've never been born again and you want to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. Right where you're sitting, we'll have the whole church pray together and you can receive the Lord Jesus as your Savior. Right where you're sitting, if that's you, I want you to raise your hand. You say, I want to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I want eternal life. I want the blood of Jesus to cleanse me from sin. I want to know when I leave here that the Lord has a mansion already prepared waiting for me. I want what you want for me, Lord. I want eternal life. I'm through with sin. I don't want to die and go to hell. I don't want to live without Jesus. I don't want to live this life without the blessings of God. If you're here and you say, today's my day, I want to receive Christ as my Savior, just lift your hand, anyone at all. Maybe you say, I have been saved, but I turned away from God. Today, I want to come back. I want to come back to the Lord, ask Him for forgiveness, to receive you back into the family. He's waiting on you. If that's you, just lift your hand. You said, I want to rededicate my life to the Lord today. Anyone at all? Anyone at all? You said, today's my day. I'm coming back. Pray this prayer out loud, please. Lord God Almighty, thank you for your love. Thank you for Jesus and his blood. I am so thankful, Lord, for the privilege that I have of living today. I am so thankful for the privilege of being in this place where your spirit dwells. I believe in my heart that Jesus died for me and rose on the third day. I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I repent of all sins. I come to you, Lord. You said to draw near to you and you would draw near to me. I thank you, Lord. We're close right now because I'm coming closer to you and you're coming closer to me. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise you, Lord.